just a sec. Recording started. Um, so let me introduce Jessica. Jessica is a co-founder and CEO of Playbook.com, a $19 million visual cloud storage startup in San Francisco. She was a part of Google early design team. She was responsible for working on Google Drive, Hangout, YouTube projects, and interviewing, reviewing, and hiring hundreds of designers. As a former Google, she was the first and head designer at Open Door, overseeing a multi-billion dollar company's product, brand, product and brand design. In addition, she has advised and contributed to the raising of hundreds of millions of dollars for more than a dozen of startups nationwide. In her role as a hiring design manager, she has seen a variety of portfolios from abysmal to extraordinary. She has authored dribbles and she continues to advise designers on building a solid portfolio. So, hi Jessica, we're so honored to have you today. Hello. Hello. Yes. Uh, it's, it's always like it's fun to, I mean, not fun. It's kind of awkward to listen to my own background. <laughs> it's like that summarizes basically my 20 years of my career, which is kind of interesting. Um, and Fred, we're just chatting and Fred is 17 years old interning at ADP list. I, I thought that what 17 I was, I was even thinking about working at the time. I was just mostly goofing around. So good for you, Fred. Thank you. And I mean, I feel like that's why we're all here today, you know, to, to get the tips of how to start your design career, to get the tips of how to keep your design career and to thrive and everything. So it's really amazing to have you here. I'm really excited. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, am, uh, I currently run a startup called Playbook, and we have a partnership with ADP List. Um, it's just so that uh, Felix and I, we, we kind of chatted, and then this is, we're, I'm building something in a design industry. We should, you know, basically support designers, just giving away cloud storage for all the designers that need cloud storage. So that's how the sort of partnership happened. And of course, I want to, I wish I could mentor a lot of people. Um, but it's like most of the time I'm coding and most of the time I'm doing social media or designing. Um, so it's really hard to find time to do, uh, you know, more, do this more regularly. So we just kind of condense it all just to three sessions. So this is the last one. Um, the first two sessions were recorded. So if you haven't gotten to watch them, um, there's a lot of good stuff. I normally teach to the college um, at Berkeley. Um, or just people who are just graduating to get into the design industry. So, and then mostly the first two sessions, I talked about portfolios, tips, what hiring managers are looking for, all of that stuff. Today was specifically, I never really got to um, go through any of the Q&A. We always run out of time. So I think I will probably save a little more time Q&A stuff. But um, the first part, just wanted to talk about maybe my background. Um, the details, all that, uh, the glitz and all that fun stuff that happens, that's usually just like more later part of my life. Um, but what happened, how do I get into design? All of that journey, you know, because it was not as, it's not as, um, what do call that, um, easy as it, 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 you know, it sound. Uh, how do I get first to recording? Fred, I think uh, Felix actually recorded them. So maybe you guys have something. Maybe, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll, be, I'll be answering all the questions in the chat. So if you have any questions for her, for me, Adipalist in general, you can drop it in the chat and I will be answering everyone. So the recording will be up on YouTube and this is being recorded too. So it will be available as soon as the, the meeting ends. Cool. All right, so how I started, um, I was, uh, I studied engineering actually, um, and I graduated a long time ago. I graduated in 2006. So, and I studied, well, first I studied chemical engineering and I interned at some plants, you know, that was like uh, Toyota, like warehouse. I worked on warehouse mostly. And then I became a mechanical engineer and then worked on AutoCAD stuff. That was just very engineering, like mechanical engineering stuff. And then um, didn't like it as much. So I switched to computer engineering, maybe third and fourth uh, years, like the last two years of my college. 
And I took a year off, um, went to work in Japan just because I wanted to and worked there as you know, teaching English and you know, just kind of doing some kind of internships, doing some data analysis, um, trying to you know, pay for the living in Japan. And then finally I graduated and then I got a job as engineer basically. It's, you know, back then it was called business analyst. It was not specific, but we're most of the time we're coding. And we're coding Java back end stuff. So it was this constant, like constant like career change. And at some point I hate I hated code. I hated back end. I hated Java. I just hated I maybe my just brain just couldn't work that way for some reason. But it just felt a lot hard for me then you know and looking at my teams who were started around the same time they seemed like they're better engineers and i just felt like i was constantly keeping up and i wasn't enjoying it much so i went through this, this period of time and this was like one year uh, working at this company hated that job by the way just absolutely hated it uh, but it's like you know apparently first jobs people always hate hated it thinking about maybe i could be a pm you know who am I? It's like, what am I good at? You know? So I'll, I'll, I was taking some evening classes, PM classes. I was taking some finance classes just to figure out what the hell I'm supposed to do. Um, and then for some reason, there's, even though I hated my job, there was the part that I really kind of enjoyed. It was the front end coding. So I really enjoy CSS and HTML. I could spend hours, I could spend like all evening just to get that pixels right. There's something about that. I just felt like I was in the zone, but then I would go and try to find a job as a software engineer. And then I would, I would basically get destroyed every single interview that I was at. Even if I, I hated this job, but I couldn't get out because there's no way I could pass another software engineering interviews. I was just not very good at that kind of stuff. But that, that particular that small little thing, 90% of the time I'm, I'm coding back end because I have to, but the front end, I just, once I get sucked into it, I just got, get, got kind of, you know, just, I, I, my time passes and I wouldn't even notice. So luckily what happened a year and a half into it, everyone on my team got a promotion and I didn't get it. It was like 10 people got promotion and there was like me who just got left out. So I was very, very sad. And of course I was young, so I was angry too. I was very angry. Of course I should be really reflecting. It's like, probably I wasn't a very good engineer, but it's easy to blame somebody. It's easy to just get angry and feel victimized. So I cried, I was angry. I you know, talked to the boss and finally I was like, I decided I really need to quit this job. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna die here. So it's weird that I actually interview multiple places and the only place that that um, accepted me was interestingly Google. It was so, it's weird that I have interviewed multiple places. Google was the only one that actually accepted um, me eventually, but it was like the front end developer job. It was not a designer, it was nothing. That, that thing that I was really like excited about doing for hours and hours, was what got me to Google. That that small little that the job that I hated uh, that that I hated it became almost like a a stepping stone into something. So I was mostly coding web pages inside Google. That was my job day to do day to day. I was coding HTML, CSS, JavaScript, very very front end stuff. And then there are times I made huge mistakes. Of course, there's the times I actually took down Google website <laughs> for hours. That, not google.com, but Google Korea uh, website. It was down for hours because I, I submitted bad code. So all kinds of stuff happened. This was back in 2007. And then, and then I'm, I started to, like I enjoyed the job, but it was not challenging enough for me. So I was looking around what else is in this, um, this company. And then I discovered, that's when I discovered UX. This was so early at Google. The entire team was probably less than, I think it was less than like 50 designers. And right now there's thousands and thousands. But back then it was like small. It included visual designers, included UX designers. Um, and then 
you know, they need somebody. It was back then, it was no, there's no Figma, there's no sketch. Everything was done in Photoshop. Even the mock ups were done in Photoshop. And if you recall what Photoshop was, it was like really meant for very sophisticated, like photo shopping. It's like photo altering photos, not necessarily a good for like wireframing, but we did it anyway, because there's no other tools back then. And then, so they would translate those mockups and then give it to engineers. And the engineers will try to build it exactly the way it should be. But there was some kind of miscommunication happened between these two teams. The static image just does not translate well into engineering coding and product, the experience side of it. So yeah, I remember Photoshop. Yeah, there you go. Early social media template pages. It's it's meant for social media, but it's not really meant for wireframing and like something that Figma does or Sketch does now. So that's when um, I I came in. I was like, guys, I could build whatever your mockups into working I, like working prototypes. So I would code HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. I would just make your mockups look like it's a, a clickable. It's like live. Not necessarily it has the, all the backend stuff, but at least it make, I can make it look like it's a real product. So you can test it out before actually going to the engineering team. And that's, I, I, of course, I was doing it out of my own, like on top of my full-time job, I was building web pages for Google, uh, mostly marketing pages. And then getting into sort of the product, the prototyping UX, I was doing it on my own time, doing it on over in the evenings and on weekends and whatever day needed something, the next day it was done. I had to basically prove to them that I was, you know, I was a hardworking person. I was ready to understand what their team does. And then I got, you know, just get closer, closer, you know, the closer to these people and UX team. And eventually I was like, you guys need a prototyper, a full-time prototyper. Um, and they were like, yes, but I wasn't, you know, there was no role in that team. Um, so that this, this is around the time, it's also timing is so interesting that Google Plus was happening. Google Plus was a big, massive project that Google was doing back in 2010. And, you know, they just assemble all the sort of the best designers, best PMs, best engineers, and turn, turn into small teams, just kind of follow what Facebook was doing. It's, Again, it was 2010, and then they needed help, a prototyper. So they pulled me in. I was like, yes. And then I worked again, evenings and weekends. Of course, this was like a year and a half into helping the team out without actually being on that team. And then finally, I, I asked, can I, can I join you guys as you know, UI designer? And of course, they hesitated. It's like, what, what is like non-designer trying to get it be a designer here? But I, I, you know, I basically show my value to them. I could, I could help out full time. Then you'll get a lot more done. So, and then I went through sort of interview process. Interview process. Internal transfer is so much easier than you know, doing it coming from outside. But that's how I kind of snuck myself into the whole UX team. First started as a UI developer, UI designer and then UX designer. And then finally I became good enough. Of course, you, you need about three years to become good at something. I became senior enough that I got into YouTube and then started designing much more sophisticated interactions. And then, and then I got to some of that a year and a half into it. I was like, what is startup like? And then I started to get, again, this like itch for something else like learning, what, what else can I do? I really was very curious about what is it like to build design from a ground up? You know, it's almost like when you're inside Google, all the design system is there. There's a team that takes care of all the design systems and brand. You know, there's team, there's a whole bunch of teams everywhere that does, you know, it's just basically this bubble that all you're doing is like kind of pulling the components together to make it work. I mean, there's some some UX stuff thinking, all the research stuff that you do, but it was not necessarily like starting from scratch was, I was kind of itched to learn that. So that's when I kind of, you know, jumped and then joined a very, very small startup um, called Open Door. And I was the first designer, founding designer. And I started brand design 
and I started product design. And I was there for about closer to four years and I built the whole team about to be about 14, 15 people. And then now there's, uh, you know, this, uh, when I started with seven people, now it's over a thousand employees in that company. So we we're going through some kind of hyper growing phase as well. So seeing it just kind of up close, what, what building up design is truly like at a startup. Well, again, it was a whole different thing that I've never experienced in my life. Google was one thing. Working with a sophisticated design system and working with the team was very different than startup where I was by myself for a long time, starting something, taking something from zero to one. So that in itself was a whole nother experience that I went through. And of course that was over. I was like, okay, what is it like to be not a designer? And that's when I started my company. Now I do marketing. I do, I still code, you know, all these years. I think all these 20 years in my life, I've always never stopped coding. So code, um, I, marketing is like, a, in and itself is a beast and I, I love it. It's, it's, again, it's like so stimulating to learn the whole industry like that. And then product design, I still do a lot of product design, but mostly I teach my uh, team how to do it. So I have, I have my bar and then I want to make sure they're meeting that bar. So I'm basically make them work really hard and iterate very quickly just to get to the, bring up the, you know, the, the quality of bar that I'm, ex, you know, ex expecting. So that's, I became sort of, this is a kind of the transitions of um, my life, my, my career. And then again, that whole background that, you know, Fred described, it was really just like the last, last bit of it. The first half was really, really, really hard. There's a lot of crying. And I forgot it all about it. And this is the kind of stuff that kind of brought me back all that emotions, that uncertainty, that, that kind of like anxiety, where, who am I, what am I good at? And then kind of comparing myself to my peers. There was no social media back then, but still I was feeling pressure to, to, you know, to fit in and to be better than these people when I wasn't, I wasn't able to keep up. So all of that experience and anxiety was confusion, all of that stuff. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, I make it easier for other people to go through that, that part of the journey. So now you understand why my background, it's, you know, I, I, I mean, now you have a sort of, you're forming a questions in your end. That's what I'm hoping with all this introductions. Um, I think that this whole topic is about tips on how to, how to start your career or design, design career. Um, I would, if you kind of, if I look back and this applies very personally to me, I think that the, the, the kind of pivotal moment was everything that I hated in my job, there was one thing that stood out. And then that was finding the niche area that I was, I was, I became very good at. I think I was obsessing over it and I found myself kind of in the zone. And that was kind of the first sign when you know that there's something, something there. And I didn't quite catch it back then, but I'm looking back, well, wow, that was actually it. And then because of that tiny experience, um, of course, 99% of the time, I, was, I, I did all the stuff that was not that in that, in that job. But that thing actually got me a, to, got me a job in, at Google, which gave me a chance to, again, it took me another three years to become a UX designer, but that got me a chance to get close to them and then you know, befriending them and then all that stuff to get to where I was. It's not, it wasn't easy. I think if you look back, that whole process was probably about four years. And if you include all the mechanical, chemical engineering, all that uh, Japan, all that weird stuff, it really was truly like six and seven years of just being in an industry that I wasn't doing design. So I think that people, I, I sometimes talk to some of the people who are thinking about transitioning, thinking about going to boot camp or changing the career, or how do I get to there? It's, it's a slightly a longer game than people realize, you know? So it's, I would say, ha be more patient is, uh, you know, it's probably one, usually one of the advices I give people. And then more practically, I think finding the niche and the finding that thing that you can get to the next place is another place. Um, another final tip that I would give to people normally is 
there's two ways to become better at something, a pro at something. And you have to be a pro to, you know, get the job that you want. Because once you become a pro, the job starts just like lined up for you. It's just that, that kind of getting it through. So just two ways you can do it. One is a paying job. Because something about that you getting paid to do somebody else's, you know, work, it's, it puts that kind of in the very, very stressful situation that you have to care. So that is the one thing. If you, you know, it's you, if you can like intrinsically it come from within that I care about this, so you're, you're I'm, I want to perfect this, but you have to, it has to be come from outside where it's like, I'm paying you to care. So, and then you do have to care at that point. So you're, you're artificially putting yourself in a spot where somebody's paying you to do that job. And second thing is obviously it's come, it has to come from within or passion, but not necessarily it happens like, you know, it's like America, they have all the media saying, follow your passion, discover your, your talent. <clears throat> but I just, it's really hard. I looking back, I don't think what I was doing was, I was like, I'm passionate about design. I, I didn't even know what design was. I didn't know what UX was, whatever that I was doing. I couldn't translate into words either. I couldn't translate into job. So I was just, so it's hard. I think the second one is a lot harder. The first one is actually slightly easier. You can actually find a paying job somehow, even if you pay very little, something, something that makes you care. And, then, and that process is a way for you to discover your talent. I would say I would find a way to put yourself in those two situations to become a pro. And pro usually takes about 10,000 hours of just doing. So the reason why, you know, really crazy, um, like, you know, designers, like they were just so born to be designers. There's reason why they're such good designers is because they actually design evenings and, you know, nights and weekends. They do that because they're just, it's that, that, uh, that I was experiencing that kind of in the zone. So when people were just doing it like nine to five designing job. These people are actually going home and thinking about it, thinking about it more in their head, and they want to just keep practicing all of that stuff. So they tend to kind of fill that 10,000 hours much faster than most people. So if somebody said it's like 10,000 hours, usually translate into about three, four years of design, you know, just, you know, being in the job, those people tend to like kind of make it closer to one and a half years or two years, and then they become really good at it. So it's just a matter. It's really, truly just math. It's putting in hours, just keep practicing. So those are some of the sort of what I've discovered from the personal story and my personal journey. And I'd love to now really just hear about what you guys uh, think about any questions. Yeah, we have a lot of questions in the chat. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Jessica. I, I'm loving this dynamic. It's really just a talk, you know, everyone's learning a lot, I'm sure. Um, let me go in the chat. Um, so, um, how has you knowing, how has knowing front end helped you as a designer asking? Cause I enjoy front end as a hobby, but sometimes I think I spend too much time on learning it and don't know if the skills will transfer to my future job. That's a good question. Uh, now that I'm, I'm okay. Now I'm wearing a hiring manager hat or a CEO hat or head of design hat. We love designers who can code. I think there's, there's a spectrum of the skills that designers bring. It's a spectrum. When somebody <clears throat> is much more visual, um, and then one is like technical, so technical being like you can code, and then one is being like extremely meticulous about visual design, like pixels and white space, you know, the layout of things. This, this side is more towards the brand design side. This side is more on the product design side because this requires a lot of interactions, like clicking and then unclick, you know, the JavaScript unclick, mouse over, all of that stuff is truly like in the product design side of things. So UX design is somewhere in this between. Everyone is shifts. It's either in the middle, either this way, it's all the way out here, but it's this spectrum of things. Usually when junior designers come in, we, we expect somebody, it would be so, easy for this person to be closer to this spectrum or closer to this spectrum because this gray area tends to be more you know like more teachable and more it's experience-based 
because all that uh, stuff in the middle is all about research, communications, or soft skills, understanding psychology of our users. All of that is kind of sort of in the middle, but it's hard skills are in this like technical or brand design it tends to be where we, it's like our sweet spot for finding the perfect junior designers because we can always teach them to go a little further this way or further this way. So it doesn't seem like right now it doesn't translate to UX design yet. And you feel like you should be really just doing UX design, UI design, and then, um, and not code. But you'd be surprised a lot of hiring people, hiring companies and hiring managers are actually looking for somebody who can code. And then they are impressed if you do, because not many designers can do that. Well, that's a great answer, actually. I feel like throughout time, your experience will tell, you know, and it will integrate areas. It's, it's code and design and everything, right? Um, yeah. We have another question. I feel like this is such an interesting topic. We need to talk about this is, did you get burnout during this time? How long did you work nights plus weekends? Yeah, that's a great question. I, you know, I had a burnout. Uh, I had a burnout at Open Door, not at Google. I was never burnt out at Google. Um, I understand what burnout is now. Now that now that I've gone through it, you go through. I let me describe what a burnout was. I I was head of design, and this is the first time I'm truly like managing a big team. I managed some small teams at Google, but not like this massive team. And I was very close to. I was reporting to CEO, and all these departments heads were you know, all these pushing design requests at me. And then there's PMs and all these stakeholders. I was managing all of that. At the same time, CEO is, of course, every time there's, you know, investor meeting happens and design has to help that out. The pressure was very, very high. We're constantly adding people. We're constantly adding marketing managers. And I think it was, uh, I think it was around that time. And I usually am very, um, it's the it's the, the people management side of things. I think that's the part that kind of burned me out. As in, I was trying to move the team forward fast, like as if it was like my own. Because you, when you're alone, you can move really fast. When you have a whole team, you got to put a system down. You got to put a whole process down. You got to put an infrastructure down. So, and then it tends to move a little slower. So I was expecting the speed I was going at with a small team, like, let's go, let's build this, let's design this. And eventually I have to carry all these forward at the same time. There's a lot of like, you know, the peer pressure from departments and also from the top and the stress just, I just could not manage all of that. But it's not necessarily the number of hours I worked because like I said, Google, I probably work way more than open door. It's the, I, it's the, um, I just didn't know where I was going. And I was, I was, I had a moment where I, I forgot my goal, personal goal, or I wasn't truly enjoying what I was doing. And then just reflecting, I was like, do I really like where I'm going? Do I really enjoy building a bigger team? Do I really enjoy doing, you know, like hiring 50 designers and then just constantly doing like carrying this forward? And I wasn't, I, that's when I had a pretty big sort of, a crash and then just didn't know where I, I was spinning and I you know this is the kind of thing that happens it's not just me everyone everyone who comes in you know not sure where who they are what they supposed to do they tip spin in their jobs and I was doing that as you know in my first job at, at, at engineer as an engineer because I wasn't really truly meant for that job but the, the other jobs I was pretty good at so I was not spinning. I knew exactly what to do. I, was, I knew exactly how to help people out. And then at one point at Open Door, I, I grew that I, I was I was meant to be an executive, but I wasn't ready or I was just I just didn't enjoy that job. So I start spinning. And that's why my brain just can couldn't, you know, like relax. So I could not sleep. I could not eat. I lost a lot of, you know, when I'm stressed, I tend to lose uh, weight. And then I basically had to stop. I stopped, I went to a much more relaxed startup job that was promising like work-life balance, all the stuff that you know people talk about. And I went there and of course there was a work-life balance. Nobody worked more than nine to five or, you know, it was very relaxed environment. Everyone's very much like relaxed, but I also didn't enjoy it. I, it's not about number of hours. It has nothing to do with intensity of work. 
I think it just had to do with I I just that place, even though that uh, the job was very relaxed and then it helped me get through my sort of the depression, depressed period of time, burnout period of time. I still wasn't happy. I think the goal I wasn't I, I wasn't sure I wanted to be a head of design again. So after one year, I quit that job. And then I basically just kind of, you know, you know, that after that job, I skipped that part because I, I didn't want to bore you guys with all, all, you can see all my zigzags, but I quit that job and then I was basically unemployed. Um, and then I started doing a lot of pitch decks designs. And then this is about finding the niche. And I wanted to be on my own for a while. So, and I realized I was really good at making pitch decks, you know, for startups, because I've been doing that all throughout Open Doors. So all these startups came to me. I made all these relationships with VCs, venture capitalists, and they will send all these startup founders to me. I started making deck one after another, and I was charging like two thousand dollars per deck, and these were like eight page decks. So and then I, and then just work just came in. All I did was putting on friends on TV, and I would be making all these pitch decks. <laughs> so and then I didn't work more than four or five hours a day. Uh, that was a that I did that for about you know, six months, but that was a very quiet period of my life. And it got me really just resolve what was happening in the past that opened door, all that um, uh, previous life. But now I'm the CEO now, I work hardest than ever. I, you know, I've never stopped working. But again, I'm not feeling the burnout. It's not, not nothing is stopping me. I think that open door, something was stopping. I couldn't move. I feel like my my goal wasn't there but all that reflection time and all of that i have my own personal goal now is sort of somehow matched and i'm learning a ton i'm learning a ton about marketing i think that was also the, the most important thing i i think that these two period of time i wasn't truly learning anything because i was doing exactly the same thing as i was doing i was pro at it but i wasn't excited about you know learning those kind of stuff and now i'm learning other stuff so I, that's a long story. So burnout, I have experienced it. It's not has nothing to do with number of hours. It has to do with your personal goal. Wow, really an awesome answer. Someone called in the chat. Alone, we move faster. Together, we get further. I, I just have to say I loved that regarding to what you said. And it's very surprising to me to know that it's not really about the number of hours, really. Um, we have another question. Would you recommend new grads to join a startup as one of their first designers? As one of the first designers, actually? You, that, that's interesting. Uh, being a first designer is actually pretty tough. Um, you're alone. Nobody thinks like you in the company. So you're, you're, even if you want some kind of feedback, nobody's going to give it to you. As in, like, it's not, a founder might give it to you as a product might give it to you, but it's not the same as a peer designer giving some sort of feedback so that you can grow. So junior designers joining a startup, it's it's very lonely. It's extremely lonely. Even I was feeling so lonely that I had to go to Dribble community just to just to put stuff up there. And I, I already had a lot of friends outside of a startup, so I would hang out with them. But generally, I was just dying for UX feedback. I was dying for any kind of just feedback. I, so I tend to advise against junior designers going into a startup alone. But if it this, this is a, a little stepping stone to get you the kind of more mature team where you will learn a ton as a designer, then I said, do it. Whatever it makes you. All of that terrible job that I went through, all of that was there just to kind of get me to the next and next, next. And this is what gets you to the next. Then I said, do it. And this is the... Only thing that's available, I definitely 100% do it. Okay, I think that answered the question. Um, we have another one. What knowledge can you provide about wanting to become a project designer? Oh, sorry, what knowledge? Yeah. Can you provide uh, can you say about it again? one thing? Yeah, of course. What knowledge can you provide about wanting to become a project designer? Wanting to be a product designer, what knowledge? Uh, let me go back and uh, whoever asked that question, are you a product designer?
let's see. There's no one uh, answering. So what? Yeah, let me what see knowledge can has. you provide? Um, so he said, I'm not a project designer, but I was wondering what I can do to become a project designer. Oh, what's your background? Yeah, are you coming from graphic design or? Oh, okay, perfect, graphic design, okay. Yes. So graphic designer, um, people tend to go to more brand design route if you're coming from graphic design. This is what I mean by this whole spectrum where brand design and graphic design and illustration tend to be much more on this side. And then product design and then technical are a little more on the rational, like logical, and then more you know, system thinking tends to be this side, where this is kind of very like art. It's very much like psychology. People's psychology also comes from that side too. So it's like when things merge is when UX happens. And then if the spectrum, again, your spectrum becomes widened over time, because as you get older, you understand the psychology of people better just by just being older and talking to a lot more people, experiencing a lot more. So graphic design, so you're coming from this side. Um, it is interesting that, um, um, how do you get to product design? It is, it is definitely a little jump. So the gradual, much more gradual that I would say, um, and it, you should experiment and you don't have to listen to me. I'm sure there's people who jump all the time. I'm sure there are people who are very good at this, both graphic design and, you know, like programming. I've seen people do that. Those people, I call them unicorns. But if you're coming, say, just like a more, you know, graphic design side of things, and then how do you get into product design? People tend to use like bootcamp to jump a little bit. Um, but these days it's becoming more and more competitive. So it's not just the bootcamp itself will get you the product design. It has to be more. So I would say I would start doing a lot of, um, uh, what is the best way? If you are trying to get a job, I would try to get a job as a brand designer first in a startup where you can transition yourself into product design fat, uh, more more smoothly. It's more like it, you need almost a gradual kind of, it's just like me gradually going from engineering to product design to now like doing marketing. It's, it's a, there's a, there's this like period of the gradual change, like transformation that happens personally. And then each time think about $10,000 just to be good at something. And then you're just constantly extending that spectrum. Graphic design, you have to actually accumulate 10,000. I'm really good at it. You extend it out to a little more brand design. Well, let's think about how to do brand design of a startup. You can go start designing brand or website, web, web pages. You start looking at white spaces or saying it, uh, you know, paddings and margins. And you should care about a lot of these things. And then now you used to go one step forward. Let's do some prototyping, um, prototypes and actually looking at screens and how, what happens when you click on that and when you cl click on this and you become almost like UI design and that's not UX design just yet, but you understand the transition of things a little bit better. And then you move on to the UX design when you start to understand sort of, you know, research and psychology and then start picking up a lot of, you know, like being able to work with engineers or in having that kind of shared language, language with engineers. So it becomes much more gradual. Oh, you're muted. Oh, I was muted. So sorry. <laughs> that happens. So, and that's an awesome answer. Uh, we have another one. For those looking to pivot into design but have not landed a job yet, what are the top three advices you would give? Uh, top advices. Let's see. Those who... Oh, those who pivot into design but have not landed a job yet. Pivot into design. And this well, this actually came up last session. There was a person that was she was a she's a pharmacist and she's taking bootcamp classes to become a UX designer. So, and what, what's the sort of what is what is the sort of backdoor way to become a UX designer? Because if you go anytime you go front head. And this is the only time you have to do is when college admissions that you really cannot, there's no backdoor of things. <laughs> you kind of have to go head on competition. 
there's so many uh, maneuvers you can do in a, in a real real world with industry. You don't have to go through all these, you know, compete with others. There's so many opportunities out there. You don't have to do this, follow everything in one path. So what I recommend to her was find a, find a startup that uh, does, you know, pharmaceutical things that your experience as a pharmacist will be actually really good for. And then join them as an, as an operator. But always mention that you're very excited about product design, but you bring that kind of knowledge industry experience into you know, the, the startup that need a lot of operations person. And then see if you can kind of transition your way into UX design. It will take some time. It's not as easy as, it's, it's, you know, the bootcamp is feel, people think it's a short code way to, to get into product design, but it's, it's really hard to actually go graduate bootcamp and then trying to get a job right off the bat as a designer. It's almost, these days, it's very, very rare. It's, you almost need a gradual path to get in there. And that usually means you bring some kind of other expertise into startup. You already start becoming useful to that startup and then they feel like they owe you. So they'll keep growing you and into some role that you want to be in. That's usually like, it's, it creates all these win-win situation. It's amazing. Always look for a back door. <laughs> <laughs> um, who was your mentor when you were stuck and feeling imposter syndrome? And what was the best piece of advice you've heard and the worst piece of advice? That's interesting. Uh, that's a very, very interesting question. My mentor, you know, surprising, I never really, there are so many people in my life that gave me a good advice, any advice, or just helped me out. And then the most important one is not actually somebody who I didn't work with. I was always doing something for that person as in, and then I was, you know, whatever that horrible, like, you know, he, he says all kinds of really mean things that it made me cry multiple times. There was a period of time we didn't talk for three months um, because he was like, Jessica, you're a terrible designer. It was early in my career. And this is me trying to become a designer. It's because he was, he was truly like one of the best visual designers at Google. And we just became friends. And then he would oversee my work. And then, of course, I'm young and I had a lot of ego. So whenever I mock something up, I would be like, hey, this is like the best thing in the world. And it was just shoot it down. Like, do you even, do you even have an idea? Like what, you know, UX design is all this stuff. So there's a, we were, there's, there's a good period of time I was receiving feedback and then I was just like getting angry. And then, and there's a period of time I got really angry. So I went through that phase and we're still really good friends. Um, probably, you know, I've known him for now 15 years and he's now the head of design at line, uh, the messenger, but he's, you know, we just kept our friendship for a very long time. Even when I became the head of design, even when I started my company, he was always kind of there as friends. So, but I was doing stuff for him. I was making prototypes for him. And in return, he would mentor me. And there was also, I would say the head of design at Google, Irene Ao, she's my advisor in my company now. Again, we have long friendship. She needed somebody that could prototype and I was able to prototype. In a way, it's not, it was a give and take was very, very clear. I give something and then that person returns something to me. So in, in sort of, I help them succeed, whatever that they were doing, and they help me sort of personally succeed as well. It, the relationship kind of falls apart when one is strongly like, so all the, you know, you seek mentors and you're asking questions. It's not a very solid relationship. You end up getting an answer, but that's it. It's a very shallow relationship. You haven't really built any relationship. You haven't given that person anything. So that tends to kind of last a very short period of time. So mentors usually, I think of them as, what can I do for that, couple, that person to succeed, whatever that they're doing? What, what is it in my possession right now that I can help? And they usually translate well into like something in return. Usually that usually doesn't come say like six months or later or 12 months later, but you know, you, you, you have to be in this like mindset of always be giving. So always return somehow, even if it doesn't translate right away. So that's what I call the most solid mentor and mentee relationship. Oh, but no, the worst good. advice I've ever got. Yeah, worst, worst advice. I've, <laughs> the best advice I've gotten, uh, oh, there's so many. 
the worst, I start with the worst. There was a, and, and this is not a mentor. It's just the, some, I was trying to be a UX designer, but I was coding and I was trying to do UX design at the same time. And he said, just pick one, just focus on it really hard. Just pick one. Um, and I thought that was the worst advice <laughs> looking back <laughs> because I, I still code. Why would I pick a UX design? I can, you know, once you reach $10,000, it's so, so easy to do the first skills. Why would I, why would I completely give up and stop and then move on to the next? I just didn't make any sense to me. I like to combine all these skills. Eventually it's almost like Pokemon. I like to collect skills. So, <laughs> so eventually a lot of good stuff happened when everything's combined. Um, good advice, great advice. I, I was a very uh, full of ego when I was young. So any advice that kind of, you know, poke needle to my balloon of ego was actually really, it really helped me so much to understand. One advice I've gotten was that, because I was like, ah, I'm right, I'm right all the time. Like I'm, it was, I didn't say it like that, but it just seemed as though that I felt like I was right. And that person said, well, you know, sometimes you are not right. And, you know, you have to kind of pretend that what if that person is right? So I never thought of that perspective before that the other person could be right. <laughs> That's how ego egotistical I was. So that helped me kind of understand the perspective of things i didn't it didn't hit me right away right away but that kind of stuck throughout my like after one year that during the whole reflection time there was a one thing that really just i need to be a better person <laughs> that's actually a great exercise if you start using like what is that person what if the person is right you know what if i'm wrong <laughs> um yeah. what are you, the top three qualities you are looking for when hiring a ux designer Oh, this is a great question. Um, you definitely, um, I like to have hard skills, this good foundation. It means that hard skills are, are it's, a, it's kind of an indication. It's a proof that that person went through some sort of pain to get there. Because um, hard skill, you can't really earn it unless you went through a painful process, process of learning it. This is why, you know, it's like, um, uh, you know the coding engineering is like really really hard so i appreciate all the stuff that engineers do and uh, i really appreciate whatever the like all that video editing stuff like it's crazy nuts like how how you know that how hard that those tools are to use uh, to learn and then there are people just really good at uh creating tiktok videos like what how do you do that i i'm very fascinated by all these people's hard skills and i'd like to be you know like this person just know how to pick up things so fast learn things so fast and what or went through a sort of in in the zone moment as painful as it was just in the zone moment to learn that skill so i'd like to see that a, a little proof of that and then the second thing i like to see is obviously the ux designer needs to be a very good communicators they have to communicate their thought process really well to engineers engineers don't usually if you work in you know design job at google or engineers are usually receive receive this mock-ups from designers you know if it's like almost feels as though it's a top down and they're very artistic people they're very they have their own thoughts they have opinions about what you have and some of them sometimes can actually make better a lot of times make better ux decisions than i did so it's, it's the, but it's the persuasion side of things. It's actually convincing people this is the right. Yeah, sometimes it's so gray that you don't know until this gets shipped, but you have to somehow come up with the rational thinking reasons why this is, this is, you know, this should be done. And, and that all, all of that stuff is, I lumped that as a soft skills. So once you have a hard skills, you have a soft skills. And then the finally, what, would impress me the most, of course, once you reach all these things, is the attitude, it's the drive. Something that you're like, somebody is so passionate about solving the problem that I'm passionate about solving. It's just sort of clicks, you know? Somebody just don't think of it as, it's the kind of people that once they start solving that problem, they would think about it in the shower. They would think about when driving or in, on commute. Something about that makes you know, the drive of it. That's not just, 
it's not just a job, but it's a sort of like almost like a perfectionism, almost like a passion, almost like something, something to prove. There's a lot of stuff there, but that is very, it's very magical when you see it. So it's again, this all these three things are extremely hard to do. Um, and sometimes it takes time. Sometimes you, you know, it's it's just not easy. So it's a it's my wish list. And a lot of times I don't see that many people that would check all these three things. Most of the time I don't. Um, and then at the bigger the team is, you'd almost never check those boxes. You tend to kind of check more the hard skills or the soft skills, either of those two things. Yeah, that's super insightful. Good to keep in mind. And to wrap up, we have our last question. Um, what are your favorite questions to ask product designers during an interview? Ooh, during an interview. Mm. I think I think design interview process is very it's really hard to see um, it's it's hard to select designers during interview process. It's first the portfolio is important because portfolio is truly like what can you do? It's the hard skill part of it. But a lot of people actually game that system now. So portfolio alone is not good enough these days because it's, you know, there's so many resources out there that make your portfolio look amazing, but truly like when it comes to your skills, it kind of falls apart. I've seen that happen also. So what is a good, I, I made hiring mistakes in the past, a lot of it. I would say most of the time, 40% of hires never turn out to be what I expect them to be. Um, even if you know you go through extensive interview process, there's always this forty percent that's just never turned out to be, um, you know, like what I expected. So now that if I and now that I have actually made mistakes, would I do things differently? Um, I think these days, um, I think this is getting more and more popular. Contract to hire is becoming very popular in startup world just to kind of understand the beginning, like how does this person work with others, how they communicate, how they do, you know, how they bring in their own skills. So contract hire usually is like two, three weeks and they get paid to do it. You know, top dollars, usually freelancing rate. And then that's that in itself tends to be a little more um, interview cycle. And you skip all of that, you know, you sit on the chair and then like all these questions come out. I think startups much prefer contract to hire these days. If you are talking about big companies and they don't have that kind of resources um, to go through all of that two weeks of period time of you know this matching period, they would ask pretty standard um, you know problem solving questions, usually UX questions. It's like my one of my 10 years, 15, 12 years ago, my interview process to get into the UX design team is like how do you design a steering wheel, you know, in this, you know this car that's shaped like this, it was, it's very much like problem solving. And I had to, you know, think about my solution and then, you know, this was basically a thought process. But even then I, 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 I was a terrible UX designer. So <laughs> I don't know, I passed. So, so I don't know how I got in. I, I think I just kind of like, uh, I don't know, I guess I would do this. <laughs> It's really hard. Uh, I, 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 I hope that somebody kind of nails the interview process. I, I really don't know, but it's a lot of people like this like thousand elevator button question, but that's been on the internet for so long that it's not helpful anymore. Um, really comes down to this is 2022 now. I would say hard skill is the king. Well, that, that's great. I mean, I think that you're just honest, which is, which is amazing. So maybe that's why you, you went through. Um, do we have time for another question? I can do another question, a quick one. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd love to know your opinion on how do you find that sweet spot between grinding and practicing constantly and avoiding burnout? Grinding. I, yeah, it, it's a, hmm. I think, I think I, I had an easier time back then than now. Now is people are much more anxious these days. I think it's the social media's fault, to be honest. I think it's the constant comparison yourself to other people. Um, and just constantly like, you know, the 
pressure of you know the all these grooves coming out is like oh you should find your passion and then you haven't found your passion that you feel like you need to speed up and you look at all these twitter feeds and then constantly people talking about you know judging people or you should be the that you should do this it's just so much noise out there and i can't imagine what that feels like i wonder i wonder i would love to you know if you guys have time as a, you know in your own time think about is it really truly the work that's burning you out or is it the relationship between your coworkers burning you out or third thing is you know is is it your own anxiety you feel like you should be doing something else you feel like you should be is it so i would try to categorize break it down these three threes and i guarantee you it's never the number of hours it's usually these two things happen it's your boss relationship your peers uh, relationship or it's the anxiety of within your own self that you have doubts or you you put a lot of pressure on yourself yeah that's an amazing answer and so guys we're wrapping up it didn't even feel like an hour honestly this was so <laughs> comfortable so peaceful thank you Jessica for being here today we have learned a lot with you and i would just like to remember everyone that we have a partnership with playbook i just submitted the link in the chat so you can um, get your free artist or designer plan with four terabytes of free lifetime storage. I have started using Playbook three weeks ago. It has been an amazing experience. It's really a great way to organize your files. And as designers, we do have a lot of files and icons and slides and everything. So please check that. It would be awesome to see everyone joining. And yeah, thank you for everyone to have come here today. It was amazing to have you all. And that's it. See you. Thank you so much. It was so fun. <laughs> Bye. Thank you for having me. Woo.